No. Yeah. <laughs> now we just have to do it. Now yeah. we just have to go on with it. Oh my gosh. Dang. I thought we were doing we were we had a really good start. conversation. <laughs> yeah, I was yeah, noticing yeah. there were no comments. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you know, sometimes people don't come right away. And I, and I, I, I <laughs> there's and three I people like, waiting. <laughs> I like to have the yeah. link ahead of time. So and I didn't get it very far ahead today. So that's a, that's a big issue. But <laughs> uh, we have been talking for 10 minutes <laughs> of <laughs> decent content. There are four people that are here now. Hey, yeah. people, thank you for coming to our show. This is Reese. I am I am today's screw up. I, we have been little secret. We've mm-hmm. been here thinking we've been talking to you all for 10 minutes. Yeah, until I pointed somebody, out that it just said scheduled at the top. <laughs> somebody forgot to push the go live button. <laughs> that was my fault. Yeah. So sorry out there, folks. Hopefully I've been too bored waiting. We had a horrible botched beginning. It was really funny how badly I screwed up. Hutch told a great story. And uh, then I, I yammered for a little while. So that was the whole deal. But hey, you know, we don't have, we're, we're, we're all friends, right? It's a small little show. We can make it work from here. Yeah, we'll, we'll call it a rehearsal. I mean, Hutch, we'll you want to retell your story? or Today, we are telling Comic-Con horror stories. They don't have to be scary. They don't have to be terrifying. They don't have to be the time a, a man in a bunny costume chased Hutch down with an axe. We don't have to have that kind of story. Although, if that happened, I want to hear about it. No. We're well, that intro me. was pretty close. Yeah, yeah. We we are we are here to tell uh to just to, to share st- uh, stories of our time going to comic conventions or gaming conventions or whatever, and they can be funny, they can be horrifying, they can be whatever we want them to be because that's the kind of show we have. So it's all clickbait, guys. It's clickbait, a hundred percent. So. Since Including we're the fact that Lousy Kids is going to have to tell that whole story again. Yeah. yeah. It'll I be can the tell it better. Time. <laughs> it's the time we've heard it. So, yeah. I, I, I have never been chased <laughs> down by anyone in a mask. <laughs> I love clickbait, Colin says. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, um, I, I, I have never been chased down by anyone with a weapon at a convention, which, now that I say that out loud, seems a little surprising to me, honestly. But I um, may have chased down somebody in a mask with a weapon at a convention or just for kicks. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, you chased them down with second. a weapon in your hand or you no, chased no, they them the down weapon. with a weapon in your hand? They had the weapon. That's perfect. <laughs> well, back to my question. Was that at a con or just for kicks? Uh, the latter. <laughs> it's not a convention story. It's not a convention story. <laughs> well, I can... I can very briefly recap what we talked about and and as concisely as possible. Uh, Reese and I talked about uh, appearing at a convention as either a writer or an artist and how a a artist can do five sketches at 20 bucks a piece and pay for a $100 table. But if you're selling a comic book with a $1, $2 profit, you have to sell 50 of them. And most always you're just there to promote things uh, because you're not going to make your money back. Uh, So it is a little bit harder as a writer to appear. Mm. And but I had the solution. Okay. The, the solution was you have to put up a sign at your table as a writer, and you have to offer for like five bucks a piece to write insults or slam poetry towards their enemies. Which I think is a killer idea. I may it have is. to implement that. Am yeah, I that good at insults, though? I'm a well, pretty that's nice guy. Well, you can work on your slam poetry. Here's, yeah. here's the here's the beauty of that, Hutch, is you don't have to care because it's not your enemy. <laughs> you have true. no emotional investment. You're, You're like, a, a meanie head, and I mean that. <laughs> whatever, whatever, whatever you do, it's not you. It's 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 uh. And it's, you uh, could yeah. uh, offer quips since that's quips. something that heroes in comics usually do, right? And just, <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah. So uh, the first time when I was appearing at a table uh, for the earlier part of the 2000s, I was generally sharing a table with Eric Burnham, who was also at Fanzing Magazine uh, with uh, Matt and I way back when, when we, we did Fanzing Magazine. Eric was on, he was mostly doing art, and but he also had a, a writing series that he had done of alternate versions of, of superhero characters. And 
Uh, I do not remember. It's been so long. So I generally thought of him as an artist and he viewed himself as a writer and an artist. And it was hard for him because he, I think he's a great artist and he mm. just lacks self-confidence and he would do a sketch and I'd say, that's great. You know, you've got to charge 20 bucks. And he's like, no, five bucks. I'm nobody. And nobody knows me. And he would do a great art piece and just not have the confidence to put the, you know, 20 bucks on there. Cause it's worth it. Somebody will pay it. And gradually over the years, he would got a little better at that a little more brave. And one time he did an art piece of Captain America versus the Predator, the the Predator uh, from the movies, you know, the the alien Predator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's a big piece. Like we're talking like a big, not not one of those little, you know, tiny art things that you do. For not like a sketch bucks. card. This was big, full color pencils, and he really worked at this. And and somebody came by, and I forget what they offered on it. He he kept wanting to accept less money because he's nobody and they're like no 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 this is great i gotta have this i do not remember what he finally sold it for it was more than he wanted to accept but it, i thought it was well worth it because it's just a beautiful piece i have it somewhere and i wanted to show it to you and the reason i have it is that sold on saturday we came in on sunday and the piece is at the front table right where next to where people are paying the tickets. And I said, what's this doing here? This guy bought it yesterday and they flip it over. There is a tire tread clearly right straight up and down across it. It had been, it had fallen over into the road and been driven oh. over. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and it was not damaged. It just had a, the dirt of a tire tread on the back and so we said, okay, leave it up here. Hopefully this person will come back and find it because they paid a good amount of money for it. And then later we took it back to our table and said, if anybody asks, you know, that, well, they'll know where we were. Hopefully they'll come back and we'll have it. And that person never showed up and Eric gave it to me. And it's it's beautiful. I don't know where it is. I went through my all my art. I thought it was in a folder over there. Can't find it to show it to you, but it's gorgeous. Eric was, he just never had the confidence to, to, you know, ask money for it. He had a really beautiful blue beetle thing with the blue beetle suspended from his bug. And he finally agreed to sell it for 20 bucks, you know, just a little sketch. But I, I kept telling him, yeah, you got it. It's just, it's good artwork. And the next year, Chuck Dixon invited him to do the Expendables book with him as co-writer. And then Eric, having worked for IDW, got invited to do Ghostbusters. And he has been has been their Ghostbusters main writer for two runs and a lot of spin-offs. And he started doing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for them. And so like two, three years later, I was appearing with him again guys show up in Ghostbusters cosplay and they're like, hey, it's Eric Burnham! <laughs> oh, it's Eric Burnham! And the pe people are like, De he's in demand. And I think he finally understood that he's appreciated. And if you have not read the IDW Ghostbusters by Eric Burnham, it's like, it's so much better than any of the movies they've done <laughs> since 2016 because it's like, this is what Ghostbusters should be. It's further stories that don't just rehash the big marshmallow man and the, you know, and Zool and just keep doing that over. It's like, it, so it kind of like the Ghostbusters the video you know? game. Yeah. 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 Like the Ghostbusters video game. There's well, and, and the thing that I am, um, Mark Pellegrini um, mm -hmm. uh, of, of, of black hops and common America fame is a, is a giant Ghostbusters fan. And at one point had done a series of videos um, outlining the different like phases in Ghostbusters comics going all the way back. Right. Um, and the TV shows, and he was talking about that series, and I can't remember what his 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 whole takeoff on it was, but one of the things that he mentioned about it um, that I think is really a strong suit is that um, Burnham had found a way to largely incorporate all of the Ghostbusters into into the into the into the into a uh, a singular pointed storyline, so it had something for whether you started. Um, watching Ghostbusters in the movies back in the 80s or the TV show in the 90s or even with the new movies, even with the, the, the 2016 movie, where it mm -hmm. still incorporated these different elements 
uh, in a way that that had that. And I, I always thought that was really intriguing. Um, I've never been so much into Ghostbusters that I, I feel like I could um, want to d- to dive in that far. <laughs> um, it's 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 uh, my life. I mean, as far as as far as um, like fictional fictional properties, um, Ghostbusters is kind of on my C tier along with like Turok, right? Like yeah. I love Turok, um, but um, and, I, and I, I'll read a Turok comic, but I'm not going to want to collect like a run of Turok. I'm not going to go back and like get all the stuff. It's just like if if I see it in a dollar bin, you know, I'm going to snag it, but I won't. I, but I'm... will you ever actually play the game? I played <laughs> one of the games um, <laughs> for the <sighs> thing was one that was on GameCube. Um, we uh, I think it was the GameCube. Or um, that we. Uh, I have I checked out from the blockbuster back in the day. (laughs) Well, Matt, if I could entice you, one of the storylines that he did had a rival company that also chases ghosts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the head of it is a not, I mean, it's not, it's not, uh, what would you say? Like licensing accurate, but it's close enough. You obviously know that it is Chevy chase. (laughs) <laughs> as the head of the thing and it is That's perfect very, and once you know that and you watch it it's like and you listen in his voice to every line that that guy does it's like so that was that actually chevy chase <laughs> i wanted to bring up i think uh in that case comics are actually the perfect uh medium for mm-hmm. continuing that type of story uh after the fact especially because like harold he's gone Right, like you, you right. can never actually yeah. have him back. But if you're reading a comic, you can always hear his voice to his likeness that's drawn on the page. Yeah, yeah, in yeah. Your head. Well, Egon isn't dead in the comics because the guy yeah, yeah. aren't thirty years older either. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you could just but, always hear his voice in your head as you see his likeness on the page, and it's like the perfect way to just continue stuff like that. That's right. I'll well, you, anyway, that's. Um, I didn't mean to get off on Ghostbusters too. No, much. that's fine. That's why I. I, I I, I, um, back in the fanzine days, I always appreciated Eric's, uh, uh, input on those. So when I saw that he'd actually made it, um, yeah. so to speak, um, I was, was really, it was really fun. There's, there's only a couple people from fanzine who, who made it, uh, and so to speak. And, um, mm. uh, yeah. And, and Scott McCuller who got to write green arrows origin, he was the guy mm. who ran the biggest green arrow site to the point that Kevin Smith went to him for, you know, hey, I'm writing Green Arrow. What do I need to know? Type of stuff. And the first thing you need to know, Kevin, is don't <laughs> write Green Arrow. <laughs> the, I uh, Scott Scott Mc. I think I can say this at this point. It's years later. Scott McCuller had to break it to him that um, that the second Green Arrow, you know, his son and the mm-hmm. guy with the guns and the shades who hung around with them, right? They they weren't a gay couple. Which is what Kevin Smith was going to write them as. <laughs> oh my God! So, yeah, but oh uh, but Scott mm. got to write the, for the um, the Green Arrow. Like, was it Secret Files and Origins? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the origin story. He got to name Green Arrow's parents, which actually carried over into the TV show. And he also Ooh. got to do a pinup of the um, uh, Green Arrow's chili on the back, which is infamous for. One of the editors saying, "We will never do stuff like Green Arrow's chili again." It's like, you know, the, when he was bragging about the next Secret Files and Origins, it's like, "No, this will be all be quality content. We won't be Green Arrow's chili and that kind of thing." Oh, but I it's love like, Green Arrow's chili. I love well, that. I mean, it's like, it's, 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 it's I, like why, this... why that got hung out there to dry is like, oh, this well, is an embarrassing like... inclusion. <laughs> Someone's gonna have to explain this one to me. Okay. Yeah. Green um, Green Arrow in comics throughout the eighties and nineties consistently bragged about his chili. Like like for some reason, I don't know who came up with a gag. Eighties and nineties, yeah. I don't know who came up with a gag, but it was there as 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 like an element within like talk, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and within the banter, or right? um, because that was the thing. Green Arrow was like Batman, except like um, bantery and and not as not as as brooding mostly. Um, yeah, yeah. And Colin says, cool. I hate to say this, but I find Green Arrow lame. You're supposed to. If yeah, you yeah. don't, you're actually not appreciating the character. Well, I mean, and that's the thing is like, is like, we are Green talking Arrow... about chili as a food, right? Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. yeah. And Green Arrow as, as a person is supposed to be super cringy. 
right? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I mean, like, I, I mean, guess I don't know if that's what everybody gets out of. Green he's Arrow. the type of guy that like sings his own theme song as he's like <laughs> rappelling into the room. <laughs> but, but the there was at the end of the because of that thing that he's infamous for his chili. The last page of that Secret Files and Origins was a one page thing. I believe it had a recipe mm-hmm. for the chili. Oh, so. And and Which, the recipe had, wasn't that bad. And the uh, compared League, to what they were showing, right? And the and the the various Justice Leaguers are going, oh, it's hot, and you know, it Man was so bad it gave bars. Superman an yeah. ulcer, and he had to use his like tundra breath to cool it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like, so that was the thing is like, the thing about that though is like that's a that's a flashback to one of my favorite things from as a child mm-hmm. was DC in the I think the late seventies, but I I saw it in a library in the eighties was the uh, the dc official cookbook and it was all of these recipes that were that were dc superhero themed uh, and um and uh, and it was and it was as a child who was like interested in comics and super friends and, and the whole business i was like well, this is kind of cool this is fun so it's it tied into this in-universe gag this repeating thing it was an actual recipe it reflected on this you know innocent fun time in in dc comics before everything was um before everything was so serious and dour the days of hostess (laughs) yeah right (laughs) so so you listen scott if you ever happen to watch this you you keep on it man that was good don't let anyone tell you yeah perfection even those guys ruined the dc universe it's those of you it was them (laughs) and and scott Scott has still stayed with comics he's still doing his own thing Mm -hmm. um his his own uh characters who are more based around the uh the shadow type era of Mm -hmm. comics so he's uh he's still doing his own which is probably just as well if you've seen dc lately you know so yeah that's uh kind of the same way he was trying to get in the same time i was trying to get in and and I've talked before about how I probably wouldn't have been happy if I'd gotten to work for DC at that era and with all yeah. the things that were happening. So, you know, yeah, he got in, he got to do once he got to say, Hey, got to appear in a DC comic, you know, and, yeah. and for his main, for the character that he loves, which supposedly doesn't happen, you know, so there's that, that that's pretty good. So um, I should tell my, my story about the uh, Falcon bath. Yes, probably. absolutely. Okay, it is not a poop story. I don't know who said that. It's Mrs. Yeah, Eight. yeah. I was like, do we want to catch up with chat first before but, that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is true. We, so we have we have in the chat. Uh, DeCronk was there. I don't know if he still is. Uh, Mrs. H had shown up, and Colin is commenting on um, on finding corny and lame characters appealing, such as Aquaman, who was neither of those things. Although <laughs> in the Brave and the Bold and, series. He probably what, was. What I find ironic is that the person complaining about Green Lantern here is uh, signified by someone wearing a green hood. Yes, <laughs> the em- the emerald, the yeah. mystical emerald man. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, he says it's funny. um, <laughs> bows were cool in the Middle Ages, but not the modern day. They're kind of lame. I mean, you say that until you're walking around San Francisco and a homeless guy on a bicycle shoots you with an arrow, <laughs> then you're not going to think they're so lame anymore. Well, I think the uh, in a superhero universe, um, archers can be done well and they can be done poorly. Mm-hmm. One thing, um, Hawkeye, for instance, in the MCU, it felt like they never really knew what to do with him because an error, an archer in a superhero universe can just go around shooting arrows at people. Or an archer can have explosive arrows. Uh, you know, punch your lights out, boxing glove arrows, magnetic <laughs> e-pulse arrows, right? He can have all kinds of crazy gadgets. Why, why do archers have to be tech people, though, right? You could go in different things. Like, you could take because... the character of Kid Icarus from Nintendo as a base point. Why not give him, like, a bow that shoots out energy? Instead, well, true. Like I mean, I, I am talking about both Green Arrow and Hawkeye, though, right? So, I mean, obviously, you know, that's where that's going to There's be. a lot of things you could do to make archers cool. Mm-hmm. And art, I think archery is... This is H says we need more poop stories. <laughs> suggesting poop arrows. 
I, I, they give you set. They would give you sepsis. That is, that is instantly. Exactly. They're just on contact. They don't have to even penetrate or anything. Anyway, that's the deal. Whether it is tech or magic or whatever, the thing that an air archer can have at their disposal is the fact that your quiver is an indeterminate amount of arrows, and you can basically say every time I pull out a new arrow, you can be doing something unique with it, mm -hmm. and that keeps up the interest factor. So, moving away from poop entirely, let's. I actually have a question. Well, for Miss H, Mrs. H, right? Because I haven't seen this tag on the end of uh, her name before, right? So I have to ask: as a coffee kappa, is it a kappa that lives in like a river or lake made of coffee, or instead of like a tea plate on your head, is it like a coffee cup? Like this is very important for me to know. It could be both. I just, I need to know the answer to this question. Well, we'll wait on oh, that. Well, <laughs> um, while we are waiting. See, I'm right more worried about what kind of pickle she's about to draw now. <laughs> it's a coffee okay, it's cup. a coffee cup. Okay. okay. Thanks for the clarity. Should I tell my story about Falcon now? The do it. Do it. Uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> so, mildly changed subjects. Late 2000s, late, late 19, pardon me, uh, right around two, year 2000, year the 1999. 98 possibly i went to falcon and this was at the falcon hotel it's not really a big convention space so there's a very small bathroom i go in there's nobody in the men's room there's two stalls and there's two urinals and the sink and that's it so i go in i go to the nearest stall sit inside close the door door opens i see two feet come in stand at the urinal and all of a sudden, the door goes slam, and this person says, "Gordon Purcell, you're my hero." And it, I'm like shocked at first, but they both start laughing, and he says, "Isn't that just your biggest fear?" <laughs> and it was Gene Ha who had seen that Gordon Purcell was going into the men's room and waited an appropriate little amount of time to surprise him and play a joke, because that is the kind of wacky guy that Gene Ha is. <sighs> so <laughs> that is. Um, I can tell you a fanzing related story about that same con, by the way, which kind of pays off later. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you remember. Um, what, there's one of the other guys who who uh, worked, for Anthony Harry, who would occasionally do stuff for fanzing as an artist, and uh, he was there. We kind of we kind of met there, so uh, I hadn't hadn't planned it. Just ran into him, and he's showing off his his uh, portfolio. And I'm looking through it. He's got some good stuff. One of them is the Phantom, the guy in the purple costume with the little you know domino mask from mm -hmm. who, uh, who hunts pirates. He's in the jungle, and he emerges, and he's he's got a gun, uh, and it's like very prominent. It's like a like the a clearing in a jungle and he's got a gun aiming it towards the, the camera and there's like people coming at him from the perspective of the camera. It's a pretty good shot. So he's showing this to Dan Jurgens. This is the first time I've met Dan Jurgens in person that same time. I stood by him while he's doing the review of, of the portfolio. But I remembered Dan Jurgens from when he was the, the cool thing I was, thought was awesome about Dan Jurgens is when he did Booster Gold 86 87 he answered the letter columns it wasn't an editor it was him and somebody asked about you know what art how can you become a comic book artist and he said everybody shows me Batman atop a gargoyle Batman on a rooftop Batman against the moon Batman posing in some way Show me Batman on the couch next, next to your Aunt Gert, and he's got a TV tray in front of him, and he's eating a bowl of Cheerios, and he just goes through this long list of, of what you, you know should be in this little mundane domestic setting of Batman sitting next to your aunt. And he said, the reason is you have to be able to draw all of this stuff for comics. You can't just be good at drawing Batman. Mm -hmm. You're going to be asked to draw everything. You have to draw everything. And I remembered this because as he's looking at this picture, really good picture of the Phantom, he says, uh, the gun, you kind of faked the gun, right? You did, you, you need to actually like see a gun, go, go to a gun shop, ask to see a gun, hold it, kind of get the idea of the weight of it, how a person holds it, um, that you don't have your finger in the trigger. If you're not ready to fire, you got to know the, some of the basics of how people hold a gun, uh, 
and and you know he he just went into some detail about what you need to do to get that drawing right because he drew he drew the phantom really well he didn't draw the gun really well or how to hold a gun really well it wasn't quite quite right and i i just i thought it was really good advice so and this will pay off later so uh in another story that i'm going to tell you <laughs> yeah so i have i've i've uh, mostly been to smaller cons so i haven't met a lot of like famous people mm -hmm. right um super famous people um uh i i got to know and, and be be decent acquaintances with um um oh my gosh i have forgotten his last name ron fortier who did a uh, green hornet with now comics um and kind of brought them the idea about doing the green hornet series mm -hmm. um and uh and he's a super cool guy um i've got to sit down and talk with with mike Barron a little bit um who is very intense and will be on the channel next week um so <laughs> there you have that there's a little advert for you um and uh i got to talk um very 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 briefly with um Oh my goodness, why am I forgetting his name? He wrote history of the history uh, I think it was the history of comics part 1. Did Nick Fury Agent of Shield? This is why I wrote all my stuff down in a mm -hmm. <laughs> precisely because I blank on people's names if I'm not prepared. Wow. I I don't <laughs> normally he was an escape artist. Doesn't matter. Scott Free? <laughs> no, no, no. A real, a real guy. Real life. Guy. Real, real escape artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Anyway, the, the dude who I can't remember, I will remember later. Got a very brief conversation with him. He did the um also did the, the cover, the painted cover for Green Hornet number one. Um uh, now it's Green Hornet number one. Um, anyway, but I got to, I was at a con in Denver and I, uh, on, and Ron introduced me to Bob Hall, um, who I had not met previously. And I, and I wasn't super familiar with his work. Um, but Bob is from, um, uh, uh, Lincoln and he was down in, in Denver at this convention. And, um, uh, Ron mentioned our little mini con out in Scott's Bluff. Well, what I didn't know is that Bob Hall um, had been a board member of a theater. Um, I can't remember what it's called. There was a theater troupe in, because um, that's what his 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 degree is actually in 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 the theater somewhere. He did comics as a way to to something to pay for room and board when he was in theater college. Um, uh, but um, he's from Nebraska, and he's he did um. In fact, I was in Lincoln this weekend, and I was able to pick up this at a for like forty cents. It's the issue of Shadow Man that he wrote and drew, featuring um, ne uh, Western Nebraska's famous Car Henge, <laughs> 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 where Shadow Man comes up to play at the Zoo Bar, which I drove by in Lincoln this weekend, and uh, 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 and and ends up running from the cops all the way across Nebraska. Um, and uh, so. Uh, I met Bob, and Bob found out we did this little mini con, and he said, "I've been looking for an excuse to go to Scotts Bluff for years anyway. That sounds great." So he came down to our convention and was like our featured guest in like year three of our of our little mini con, and uh, and it was really cool to sit and talk to him about all the projects he's worked on and um, and and uh, and all kinds of stuff. So he ended up being uh, an assistant editor at Marvel for a while, um, and. Um, uh, and so um, just because he happened to be available at the time was kind of how that worked out as well as um, writing and drawing for them and, you know, co-creating Avengers West Coast and um, all kinds of stuff. So um, that's probably the, the most famous person um, other than uh, I am so embarrassed. I still cannot remember that other fellow's name. It will come to me in my sleep. I will wake up in the middle of the night and be just like, <laughs> that's always how it works out. That's, a, that's the worst. That's the worst. <laughs> that's the worst. And so this makes this my most embarrassing con story is, is forgetting <laughs> that guy's name.
So there you go. <laughs> I forgot something uh, interesting. I went to see Dan Jurgens a few years ago and told him I'd found this poster from when he took over after the Giffen uh, Justice League finished its course. He was like the next writer of the Justice League, and he did a cover of the uh, it's a, a spread of the all the justice league characters from that new era and uh and so i asked i said i can't believe i've seen you at so many conventions now over the years i've never thought to have you sign this poster and i just found it in my closet i should have you sign it and he he pulled off the plastic sleeve and he opened it up just enough far enough to get the edge and he he signs it and he says you know i have not seen this in years do you mind i said no go ahead he unrolls the poster and he's looking at it across the whole thing and he gets to the other end he says i did sign it over here so i have it signed twice by dan jurgens in both corners i'd That's had it funny. signed by him so long ago i'd forgotten <laughs> that i did that <laughs> that's amazing so someday i will sell the double signed justice league poster <laughs> <It'll be worth laughs> what you should have done after the very first time he thought about it is you should have gotten him to sign a little bit of it every single time that you went to a convention that he was that's true and just start collecting his signature over the, the course of years yeah and put a year on every time i have him sign it <laughs> I, yeah, i've never I, had a chance to, i've never had a chance to meet dan but i'd really like to um he did a very brief run on aquaman i'm um, following eric larson's very mixed run that kind of ended up that third um series um and um uh, uh the third volume and it was such a great story that um i uh, I, I would really like to to pick his brain about why he decided to make some of the choices he did and and uh you know because he he really was able to i don't know if he just had the the um uh i don't know if he had the the the, the edict to wrap up the whole series but um but it was because it was it was in the same series that Peter David's story had it, and then he was taken off the title or left the title, and I'm not sure what it was. But then Eric Larson came in and um, picked up from um, where sort of kind of where David left off, but kind of like took a, a hard left turn, so to speak, and uh, and uh, and and really kind of it, it ended up floundering. Um, and then when uh, Jurgens came on, uh, it really kind of like wrapped up all the loose ends and, and ended in a really, really fun place. And so um I would know I'd really like to to hear more about that. But I've never had a chance to to be anywhere where he was. He's, so he's really nice. I'm not saying we're we're friends or anything, but I think he's seen me enough that if he sees me he's like, oh that guy, you know. But uh, <laughs> although hopefully next time I see him I'll have lost lost so much weight he'll be like, oh you're that guy? <laughs> but who knows? But uh, actually, last time, last convention I was at where I appeared as a exhibiting person, you know, at a table, uh, I was in the back area uh, eating lunch and I saw Gordon Purcell and sat down with him and Dan Jurgens was also there. And so I'm like, I'm eating with Jurgens and Purcell. That's really cool. They, they didn't mind. And I, I, I said to Gordon, you know, I feel like I'm not really taking advantage of the fact that I'm at these, this convention with all these wonderful artists and again and again, and I never, I, I'm not really an art collector type guy, but it's like, shouldn't I be like paying money to have like you guys draw elongated man for me, like putting together elongated man sketchbook, get Gene Ha to draw elongated man for me. I should be doing stuff like that. And he's like, if you're going to come up with the money, why wouldn't you have Gene Ha draw your own character? <laughs> I'm like, I, I sometimes forget that I'm trying to be a professional here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That would definitely be something. Well, yeah, that's, that's what comes to is like, you know, that, that, that line um, mm -hmm. where we're, uh, we're, we're fans first. Yeah, and the reason we want to write is because we, we we are fans of the genre so much. So I know that like I was um, at the first convention I was ever at was the Cheyenne Comic Con. Uh, it only ran for two years, but we were there in the inaugural year, and this was twenty, I think sixteen, fifteen, sixteen, something like that. Um, and uh, we didn't have stuff together to sell anything at the at the table, and hadn't gotten our tax forms put together, and it was a it was a whole ordeal. Mm -hmm. um, so we just went, 
right? We, we spent our coin and just went and, and, and tried to get things there. But I got to meet um, uh, uh, Shaw, um, uh, Scott Shaw, who had a, a panel at the thing on his oddball comics. Yeah. Um, and it was a really, this is the thing, is, is a weird experience because he was um, really, like, aggressive, <laughs> Right. And I don't know if it was because he wasn't feeling well or he was tired or what it was, but um, he was very short the two times I interacted with him directly. And I went to his panel and, and he seemed very gregarious and I was I enjoyed presenting his material on all that kind of stuff. But I stopped by his table once. And of course, I didn't have any extra money because, I mean, we brought lunch meat to, to, to eat. Mm -hmm. we, we, had, we spent all of our extra scratch on getting there. Yeah. On, on 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 that so i, I didn't I, and the food prices are always oh well, yeah it was, it was insane yeah. so yeah. so um uh, uh so i didn't have a lot of extra scratch so i went to his table and i wasn't super familiar with him other than the website that was that that i'd seen like every once and again um but he he seemed like he just didn't have the time for somebody who was just looking to look right mm -hmm. and then he stopped by my table and looked things over and like smiled and walked on and like <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm not sure if he was like returning the favor <laughs> or what the thing was. Yeah. But, but uh well, yeah. It may have just been a bad was, day for him. You have, you have no idea what goes on. I have no idea. And I, and yeah. I, and I don't want to take it personally. It's just yeah. that because I've, I've talked to other people who have been like, well, he's such a nice guy. And I'm like, that was not my experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I was at Wizard World, probably around 2003. Uh, 2004, 2005, somewhere around there. I was going. I was when I was, you know, there, uh, manning my table, trying to sell my Metro Med comics and things like that. I'd get away and I'd get, you know, around sometimes, and I saw that, um, like Cynthia Rothrock, the martial artist who's, you know, in movies all through the 90s, has like an a table in Artist Alley. She had to pay for a table. So did Martin Nord Nodell, the guy who created Green Lantern. He has to pay for his own table in artist alley and meanwhile the insane clown posse has a mob of people shouting icp icp and it's like okay so they're they're the invited guests to a comic book convention we don't even know why it's just a guest to get people here you know and this is around the time that you know the convention started bringing in the superstars from the TV shows of the hottest TV show of the time and they're appearing and signing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, the people who are there are the normal, like uh, the guy who played incredible Hulk uh, back in the seventies yeah, is there. Frigno. Yeah. Lou Frigno. And, um, and the guy who played Buck Rogers is there and he's got a few people standing at his table, you know, and there's a few others. And I see this guy sitting like this at his table He's got nobody at his table. And this is where, you know, right amongst Lou Frigno and the others. And I'm like, so I don't recognize this guy. And I, I'm lingering past and I see all the pictures he's got spread out. And I said, wait a minute. You were, you were the guy, you were one of the dinner guests in Beetlejuice. He says, yes, I was. I'm like, you were, you're the mayor. You're the mayor in, um, in the, the, what was it? The, the, you know, the, the Christmas. Groundhog Day. What? Groundhog Day? No, what? not Groundhog oh, Day. Okay. No, the the mayor in the um, the animated uh, pumpkin guy who wants, oh. steals Christmas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Nightmare yeah. Before Christmas. Nightmare Ooh. Before Christmas. Thank you. He's like, oh, you're the two headed mayor. He's like, yeah. And ah. I said, you're the, you're the, you're the senator in the remake of Planet of the Apes. That was my favorite character. And he goes from this to. Yes, I was. He's like, really? I, I'm like, I cheered him up. He was having it's a. Like, pet. Nobody knows that role. <laughs> it's Glenn Shaddix is his name, and he's a character actor, mostly known because he's always in Tim Burton stuff. You know, yeah. if it wasn't for Tim Burton dragging him along, he might, you know, have most people wouldn't know him from all the other things he's done that were non-Burton. You know, mm -hmm. it, there's not much, but, uh, but there's all these Tim Burton things that I'm like looking through. It's like. I, you know this character oh yeah you're this guy that's right you're this guy you know he's 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 one of those guys he's the this guy <laughs> but uh right. 
So, yes, Buck I'm Rogers was a you show see, in the uh, late 70s. <laughs> you see a lot of recurring people in Tim Burton stuff because he often just yeah. hires a bunch of his friends to do things. Mm. Right. Well, yeah. And, yeah. Which so, is fair. I mean, if I made films, I'd hire a bunch of my friends to do stuff too. <laughs> yeah. Especially if you know that they'll show up and they perform and they hit their mark. And, you know, it's like every time you work with somebody who wasn't a pain last time, keep yeah, them like, well, next, Why you know, try yeah. someone new? I don't know if you're going to work. That's right. Yep. So, well, I mean, yeah. like, then you get people that, that they just they just get the, the, the nature of the property, right? So, mm -hmm. um, like, a really good example of, of that kind of thing is, is a, a Greg Garcia. Um, well, my name is Earl raising hope, um, uh, was that he did a short run series for, uh, um, Amazon. Um, I can't remember what it's called though. Um, sprung, I think it is, but like, he just has the same, same several people because they all kind of get the vision of what he's going for. Mm -hmm. with it. So, um, yeah. Um, Buck Rogers ran for, I think four seasons in the late seventies. Yeah. Um, it was it was off the air by the time I was aware of it, but the merch was still in like five and dime shops up through like eighty seven. That's what Twiki is from. The where the little robot, the silver robot that doesn't oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. anything but wobbles back and forth with BD 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 buck. You know, it's like that got tiresome very fast. <laughs> the show ran for four years and he's yeah. But um yeah, that was that's Mel Blank doing the voice too. But uh, oh, really? Yeah, but the BD, BD, BD thing is like, oh my goodness, that's. <laughs> I wish they hadn't come up with that <laughs> for the, the voice. Although it is what we all talk about now if we ever talk about the Buck Rogers show. I, I don't yeah. know if Mel Blank can do wrong. I'm just saying. I don't know. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying, you you listen, did, I'm just saying, you know, uh, binge binge watch that show sometime, and, uh, and you want to kill him a few hours. <laughs> <in>. <laughs> you should you should never kill the kid's sidekick, even that's if he's right. a robot. That's that's just the rule. Plus, I always I don't blame the actor. I always blame the director. Right. Somebody yeah. decided he needed to do that, not him. <laughs> right. And there were two, and there were two actors. So yeah. there was a guy in the suit, and then there was Mel Blanc. Yep. Yeah. I don't yeah. know though. Mel Blanc is is pretty famous for having come up with his own characters. Hmm. Yeah, but the director could always said no. Yeah. yeah, we don't know. It doesn't matter because we don't hear to don't talk say about no to Mel Blanc. That was that was <laughs> that was just a, a flash in the pan. Yeah. So, um, I think Gil Gerard. Gil Gerard is the actor I saw. Yes, that is who played Bill Buck Rogers. Oh, yeah. I knew the name would. Did did the name come to you of the uh, escape artist? The famous yeah, yeah, artist? yeah. It was. It was. Uh, I had to look it up though. I had to look it up. <laughs> is Jim Steranko? Ah, okay. Right. Well, and and here. So here's the here, here's my Jim Steranko story. It, it's really brief. Um, is as I went to this con and I saw Steranko was going to be there, and the only Steranko that I had at the time was the the painted cover for Green Hornet number one, and I had I had that, um, and. I, I love the work and I love Steranko's stuff. And he's such an apologetics apologist for comics mm -hmm. that um, I was really, I was, I was really anxious to have, I wanted him to, to, to sign my book. However, Steranko charges quite a bit for his signature. Hmm. And I was, I didn't have that scratch. I was super intimidated. I didn't want to insult him. Right. Uh, I didn't want to waste his time. I know people are there for a thing. So as he was packing up, Right. And before I packed up, um, I went over, I said, I didn't have time and I, I, I couldn't afford a signature, but I really wanted to tell you uh, like how much you, like your eye toward design and the impact on comics. That's awesome. And I just wanted to say thanks for, for showing up in Denver. And he was just like, you could have come and talked any time. I want people to talk to come sit down for a little bit. <laughs> and and uh, and so we had just had talked for like three or four minutes about stuff and and uh, and I mean just really quick because like he was packing up but uh -huh. like he wanted to take the time to just like take a few minutes and I was just really impressed with Steranko. So I, this wasn't at a convention, but if we got a, just a minute, I saw Steranko. I I you know I'm not a Marvel reader, but mm -hmm. he was the artist on Agent of Shield, right? Mm -hmm. Then I have it right. Okay, this this was in some documentary i saw ages ago that probably uh, maybe you've seen it maybe not but they were talking about censorship in comics just as like a, a subject you know in one little segment of it and they're talking about how there was supposed to be a page that ended with with um 
you know, with the, the main character and this woman embracing, and it was just a silhouette of them embracing very hot, you know, suggestive, like they're about to go to bed. And they, and the, the editorial was like, this is too suggestive for this all ages comic. And they repurposed some art from elsewhere on his page of just a shot of the, of Nick Fury's hip with the gun in the uh, holster. And Stranko's like, that is more suggestive than I would have ever done. <laughs> if they, Oh my gosh, a gun in a holster? Are you kidding? <laughs> you may as well have a train going into a tunnel. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't have a tasteful silhouette of the couple embracing. You had to put the holster. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing it is <laughs> and Stranko was like I would have never tried to do that <laughs> so, so, oh that's great <laughs> so well, let, let's, uh, let's direct this a little bit Metal what is your worst experience at a convention mm. Uh, I th I think I told you this before the uh, stream, but all, all of my experiences have kind of been either mundane to positive. I've, I don't think I've ever had a bad experience at a convention. Uh, aside from, like, I don't know. I, I guess there were weird idiots, not at comic conventions. Uh, I've never had a bad one at comic conventions. But, like, at uh, anime conventions back in the day, there were, like, it was, you know, the yaoi paddles and stuff like that, and but that that's just mundane now, right? Like as as bad as that might have felt at first. That's just like normal stuff. So <laughs> Yes. In in the world of of uh of uh uh of uh drag queen story hour at Yaoi panel seems <laughs> seems uh yeah, yeah. mundane. Boring even. Yeah. yeah. So how how about you, Hutch? You ever had a, a horrible experience? I have had one very uncomfortable experience. Actually, two, but one is way more. Uh, I'll tell you about the worst one. Uh, the aforementioned Eric Burnham invited me to share his table that he'd already paid for. So I would just be sitting at his table. He didn't charge me anything at Wizard World. And that Ooh. is a pricier artist alley. You know, it's like you got to pay to be there. So uh, he paid for an artist alley table, invited me to sit with him for nothing. And... And so, you know, that's that's how nice he is, just for you to so understand. By the way, I screwed up. It wasn't uh, The Expendables. He, it was The A-Team. The A-Team movie came out, and they were doing an A-Team movie, and he did two of the four characters with Chuck. That's why they split yeah. it up. Yeah. Anyway, he. Um, so I'm sitting at his table. This guy comes up, says, Michael Hutchison. I said, yes. And I looked at his name tag, and the name looked familiar, but I could not place it. And he's like, yeah, sexual what? And I'm like, what? Sexual what? <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> he says, you wrote sexual what? And I said, no, I haven't. <laughs> I ha But I knew the guy's name. As I'm looking at it, I'm like, I know this guy's name. What did I? And he's like, no, you, you, wrote, the, you wrote the script for sexual what? And I drew it. And I said, no, that's not me. That's. That must be another Michael Hutchison. Is that possible? And he says, uh, I thought that I worked with you. I was like, no. He's like, it was called sexual what? Because it was about sexual harassment. And the guy says, I'm charging you with sexual harassment. The guy says, sexual what? And that's the title of the story. I'm like, oh, thank goodness. That was, could have gone a lot more worse. <laughs> but, but I'm trying to place what I know him from because I still know his name. <laughs> and I don't know that I don't know that the name's, guy's name is actually Michael Hutchison, or maybe it's a Michael Hutchinson or Hutchens. I've got that up, up until that guy killed himself, you know, from in excess. It's like <laughs> it's like you have the same name. It's it's half the same. But you know, this uh, I'm like maybe maybe there is a Michael Hutchison that that wrote sexual what with you, and you thought it was me. And I'm like, did you? contribute to fanzing he's like yeah and i'm like there you go that's why i know this guy's name he's an artist and and he's like i gotta show you i gotta show you all the stuff i did he's got this very manic personality 
and he's he's laying out his his uh, portfolio, and then he comes around the table, and and is like on my side of the table with me. And <laughs> after about ten minutes, Eric is like, "You got to get him out of here. This is we, you know, the yeah, on this side of the table is like a privilege. You don't just come over here." <laughs> I'm like, "Yeah, I know. I don't." how to get rid of him but he's showing me the his portfolio and he's like look at green lantern's muscles look at hell jordan's he's like showing hell jordan's arm the muscles like, look at the definition of the muscles i'm like green lantern's not a muscular character you know? i've never looked at the muscles and he's like yeah 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 I, this is what i he's like, showing me all the characters and it's all batman in a pose batman on a rooftop you know the typical stuff we uh-huh. talked about and i'm like yeah but you know you also have to do cars and buildings like buildings are easy well he's drawn buildings it's line 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 you know, for the, that's that's his his buildings in the background i'm like no you got to be able to draw the, the you got to draw buildings really well. You've got to do a car. He shows. He's like, here I have a car. And he shows. I don't know how to explain this. You know, a perspective shot where you've you've drawn everything off to the horizon right. where everything's and and then you draw those angles that way. So he's drawing an SUV. The front is facing the reader, and then the back angles downward, way too sharp for the oh. distance of you know eight mm-hmm. feet at the ten foot length, and. And the di- the top of the car is so angled downward that it only comes up to the Hulk's crotch, and the crotch is and the Hulk is standing behind it like roar, and it looks for all the world like he's humping an SUV. <laughs> and, <laughs> a badly proportioned SUV, <laughs> and it's just and the name of that be- comic was what? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is just his portfolio, and I'm not saying his name. I don't want anybody to find him and embarrass him. It's not. It's just. I'm. Just, this is. I'm like trying to say, yeah, you know, it, you're not ready for prime time, but you know, good luck to you. <laughs> and it's coming from me. I'm not. You know, go show this to an artist. They can tell you what's wrong. I can't, but. Uh, it's Dan but Jurgens really is right I, over there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Oh no! No! no. <laughs> if only he had been there, I would have sent him directly to Dan Jurgens. So he had already skipped out of the building. <laughs> <laughs> the, my my. My worst con experience. Are you? Is, are you? Are, that was I'm it. Not, that was it. Okay. That was it. Yeah. Go ahead. My, my worst con experience is not about the con, like the 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 the, the art and the the people that come to watch it and the customers and all that kind of stuff. Um, my worst con experience was <clears throat> one time, and I won't say what what con it was. Um, but Barry and I had been regulars at this particular local convention, and we had um always because we have our, our our laptops there and we use that to keep track of our inventory and our sales and everything else um uh and so we uh we always would would shell out a little extra for um power for electricity at this at this local convention site it's kind of small and not every place can have power so um we'd always pay the extra you know 25 30 bucks or whatever it was so we could make sure we have electricity there because otherwise we can't make sales we can't keep track of it it's a whole big mess um plus when things are really slow we work on comics <laughs> right there at the convention um and so uh that was that was the sort of thing well it's a week before the con we're totally getting amped to do we've got a a, a new printing of of one of our comics ready to go we're getting everything together and um we get a call an email from one of the con organizers who's just like so uh yeah, you know how you you got a, a space with this extra stuff. He's like, well, well, yeah. And he said, and you know how you paid extra for uh, power. And I'm like, uh, yeah. So we kind of double sold power spots. Oh no. <laughs> like, mm. Okay. And he's like, and we've already like deposited the money in ways we can't get it back out again, so we can't oh, give you a refund. <laughs> it was just like, <laughs> okay. So either we can give you some extra free badges or we can, you know, get you in next year or you can just eat 
the loss. <laughs> I was oh like, God. I said, or we can, or we can give you get you some extra badges and give you a non-powered slot. And I'm like, I guess we'll take the extra badges. I mean, we don't need extra badges, right? We already had. How about know, give me a, a discount on next year? Yeah, I mean, yeah, they that they the dude who was the dude couldn't give us a discount next year, but could give us a. A spot next year. How about a really long cable over to the one yeah, square well, plug of the electric? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, so wow. anyway, so we ended up we ended up getting a, a spot like right down one of the aisles and got just like lost in the mess and it wasn't a great location and we didn't have electricity so we had to you know it was a whole ordeal but mm. not my favorite thing but that was that was like my worst experience and and like and they tried to be really gracious and uh, effusively apologize the whole weekend long anytime one of the guys would come by the booth and like guys thank you so much we're so sorry and i'm just like <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> Yeah. So con people are just not business people. Well, some of them aren't. I mean, these, these guys they they usually do a pretty good job of it. Um, so like if, if anybody's out there who happens to spot by, if, if you recognize yourself in the story, <laughs> it's not personal. <laughs> <laughs> do you do you know uh, Pat Gleason? I mean, not personally, but you know yeah. who that is. He's the artist uh, on yeah, I think so. Lantern. Yeah, he did. A, and, yeah, he, uh, he, did uh, he did uh, Aquaman after Vice has left the book. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, he's uh, he's a great artist. And oh yeah. Oh god. Yeah. And uh, I'm so I'm talking to him around mm -hmm. the mid 2000s. Hadn't seen him for a couple of years, but I'd seen him around because he's somewhere here in the Midwest. And mm -hmm. uh, so this is like an Iowa icon or something like that. I see him. Um, this would be around the time of uh, Batman Begins when I was down there for Iowa Icon. So okay. probably that yeah. year. So. Um, yeah, so I'm down there. I see Pat Gleason. This would be around the time of Green Lantern Returns. So, uh, so I'm talking to him, and I, I said, you know, you, I said that that page that you did, where Batman is in the Watchtower and Guy Gardner is mooning him from outer space with his butt pressed up against the glass of the Watchtower. I said, that is iconic. That page, that page has got, you got to tell me how much that page went for. Cause that's, if you've sold that yet, I can only imagine how much that's going to go for. It's a great page. And he says, my, uh, my editor asked me for it. I said, you, what do you mean? You mean he, he said he'd pay for it. And he says, no, he just asked me to give it to him. I'm like, that's, that's like, I, and I didn't say this to him, but I'm like, I'm amazed because, and he didn't say which editor it is. I didn't look it up, but it's like, I'm amazed because that's like taking money out of your, <laughs> out of your kids' mouths. You know, it's like, that's, that's going to sell for a huge and you just ask for it. <laughs> it's like, I can't imagine doing that. And I said, what, you know, you did the, um, the work week, welcome to the working week with Patton Oswalt, where it was, and there's like a two page spread that has like every Justice Leaguer and extra DC character who would be at a rave, a bar type, you know, drinking thing. They even had Bator from Hitman as the bartender. There's mm -hmm. every DC character they could come up with who would be right for hanging around at this thing. He drew all of this. It is a huge picture. He's a, yeah, my uh, my editor asked me for that one. And I'm like, who is this guy? <laughs> just, just, hey, this great, great piece of art you've done. Can I have it? <laughs> so, can I have this? <laughs> I don't know who that is. He must really like the guy. Or it's just like, a, you want to work next year? <laughs> Jeez. I don't know. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's, that's horrifying. I don't I mean, know. Could I have some, could just I'm depend on your personality, friends, but, right? Yeah, because like, yeah. I, I would sooner give a page to like a friend or even somebody I worked with than I yeah. would to actually sell it. Uh, I'm not that attached to the page. If somebody gave me an offer, I would sell a page. But like, I, I'd rather just give it to somebody I know than mm -hmm. sell it. Mm -hmm. But if they ever went up for sale, those two pages would be like out of all the things he's ever drawn, <laughs> the ones that would get the mucho cash. <laughs> I just felt bad. That's nuts, though. But, Okay, should I should I tell my story about meeting the creator of Elongated Man? Go go for it. <laughs> I am the world's biggest Elongated Man fan. I uh, did. I don't think I've even heard this story. Really? Okay. Yeah. 
this Carmine Infantino was promoting his biography book that he came up with. That he's, he did it with a co-writer, Carmine Infantino, with Jay Dervitz, David Spurlock. And so this would be around 2000. It's at Falcon, and Carmine is going to do a QA. and a and I am just so glad to be there. I'm listening to all the amazing stories. He he told one story about the um, the Batman cover he did that sold the most. It was like one of the best-selling Batman issue ever. And it has Batman lying prone and and Catwoman and Batgirl are fighting over his body. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know that cover. Okay. That's That cover sold like mil- millions. You know, oh, <laughs> it yeah. was the big, the, the big yeah. seller. And he said that actually was a suggestion from Jay Moulton, from Moulton Marston, William Moulton Marston, the creator of Wonder Woman. He's like, he suggested that layout. Now, Marston's dead by that time, by the 60s. But um, but this was like something he had drawn or some, you know, basic layout that he had talked over with Carmine. Somehow Carmine knew about this layout from him. Mm. And he says this. He's like the, the the women over the man's prone body and they're fighting over him. It's all sexually suggestive. And, uh, and he's like, and I thought, you know, that wouldn't be so bad. And it's like, it's sold like crazy. And he says, you know, when we got in trouble in the 50s, there's this this crazy guy, the seduction of the innocent guy, Fred Wortham. He's he's saying that we're putting in all these bad messages for kids, and we got all these sexual layers that are, you know, it's like, you're crazy. That's not in there. But he says, you know, with William Moulton Marston, he probably wasn't too far off. <laughs> with all the suggestive stuff. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I need to hear somebody actually admit that. <laughs> well, that was, I was, it was, uh, it, you know, not to steal thunder from your show, but that was one of yeah. the big themes of, of Shaw's um, talk in, in Cheyenne with Scott really? Shaw's whole talk. And from Oddball Comics, he had, had a whole section of, of covers that were all like, you know, suggestive covers. Yeah. And, and, well, and specifically Wonder Woman, Supergirl covers, all that kind of stuff. The, the first um, two years, three years of Wonder Woman was, she was tied up a lot. Oh yeah. In, oh. in 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 actual tied up things from you know illustrations and pictures that he had, <laughs> it's like, yeah. So, uh, but this is how you how she loses her powers if she's tied up by a man, you know, or if she has her bracelets joined by a man and type of stuff. So, yeah. The um, there's a lot lot in there that's uh, <laughs> that's got the psychosexual stuff from him. Mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not a secret. Yeah, yeah, no, not at all. Uh, Fizz in the chat says, I don't get the Batman's gay accusations. I think he was referring to Wortham as it comes off right. as extremely predatory. Exactly. And yes. Most of, the, most of the stuff that Wortham said was crazy. Right. Like, well, just, and, but well, the, the, yeah. I, was, <laughs> well, I, I had a, 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 a Philip Cummings, a Captain Cummings has been on um, mm-hmm. the show before, and he did um, one of his uh, um, uh, paper. He did a paper on, on Seduction of the Innocent. Um, and wrote a, a an excerpt of his of his uh, um, scholastic paper on our website, um, and um, one of the things about it is, like Wortham's argumentation was not wrong; it just wasn't right. It was like an incomplete in the way it was. So, like mm-hmm. a lot of the things that Wortham was worried about are things to be worried about. Yeah, but he ne- did not. But there are cases where he read them into context where they weren't there. Um, at the same time, explicated them in context where they were there. So you look at, at Marston's Wonder Woman, and obviously the stuff that Wortham is concerned about is present. Yeah. Um, but like one of his concerns with the Superman character was that it was fascistic. Well, right. Superman isn't really fascistic um, because it's not about government control of power. Um, if anything, um, Superman is, an, is 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 opposition to the government. Right. Uh, is, is, is justice and as opposed to government force when necessary. Well, so there's always that alternate universe or dark future where he has well, become the government. Well, yeah, well, yeah. Let, let's let's leave that aside for the moment. That's, yeah. that's <laughs> gonna, uh, we'll go so far afield I'll never get to the end of the story. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there was it was yeah, I was wasn't saying that everything that Wortham said was merit had merit, just that yeah, yeah, yeah. there's there's some things like yeah, one woman in the yeah, mm. <laughs> and but yeah, that cover was a was somehow conceived by Marston, or or he had drawn something kind of like it that mm. 
anyway, the uh, so I finally get my chance to ask him a question, and and um, and I I just stood up and I said I I am the world's biggest elongated man fan. I don't think the, that the character gets enough attention. I I have a website devoted to him, and I've I've uh, I just I think he's awesome, and it's so great to finally meet you. I did have a question. I don't remember what it was now. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm gushing, and and I said, do you think he needs to you know be be featured more or something like that and and he he takes a second and he says you've you've heard of plastic man right <laughs> I'm trying to remember his name <laughs> <laughs> I'm like my my I'm crestfallen because I'm like everybody brings up plastic man. Longer the man's different from him, you know. And it's like and the, the one person you were hoping wouldn't bring up plastic man. <laughs> he, says, he said, "I did not know that DC had acquired plastic man. If I'd known that, I never would have named him elongated man. He would have been oh. the Silver Age plastic man, <laughs> or, or we'd have just used plastic man." <laughs> and, yeah, and, and uh, I'm like, oh man, just crushed he crushed me <laughs> well and i can understand that from a from you know the, how they're doing the silver age and everything too but the mm -hmm. elements that they put in especially the relationship elements that they put in with sue and with, yeah. with the nature of who ralph was as a person um i i love plastic man but like they're just there's just they're just different as long as you do plastic man the way he should be done the, yes. the, the classic jack mm -hmm. cole way he's mm -hmm. very different from yeah from yeah, uh, yeah. Sue, but I did yeah. get to see him later to buy his book, and he grabs the book and he draws a sketch of Elongated Man for me, and says, "To the world's greatest Elongated Man fan." <laughs> and as he's as he's drawing it, his co-artist kind of does this, just kind of the the, guy, the co writer who who wrote the book with him says people have been coming up to him and asking him, offering him hundreds of dollars to do a sketch. He won't do a sketch. <laughs> I'm like, wow. <laughs> so <laughs> he would not do a sketch for anybody. He did a sketch for me and for wow. the, oh, that's amazing. so yeah. So it went from a really bad story. <laughs> where the, the guy who made elongated man is like, nah, elongated man. <laughs> that's, that's the world's well, most I mean... valuable pity sketch. <laughs> 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 I mean, it, it just, a story about elongated man and plastic man. I think that's a bit of a stretch. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There, there's a Bob Rosakis created a stretching hero called Stretch. Mm -hmm. and I wrote a I wrote a fan fiction about him and fanzing back in the day. <laughs> I never liked Stretch because he came up with the Gingold thing before elongated yeah. man did. But yeah. by the way, does I pronounce it Gingold? And when they put it on the Flash TV show, they called it Gin Gold. That doesn't make uh, any sense. Because it's the Gingo fruit. You wouldn't call it the Jingo fruit. Right? <laughs> it's like Jingoism. So <laughs> it's got to be Gingold. That's <laughs> but, what they also, but they also pronounce Sue's name Dearbon instead of Dearbon, which is how I always <laughs> thought it was pronounced. So They, they yeah. say everything wrong on those shows. Like, if they Probably. have the chance to say something wrong, they will say it wrong. <laughs> yeah. Burry Ellen. Well, do you think? That, <laughs> do you think they do it on purpose? No, I just think they don't. no. They're just very incompetent. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. So they're not from around here. That's part of the issue. Right? <laughs> there are all these coastal people writing about people in Kansas, so they just don't understand it at all. Yeah, and, and they also like don't bother to do research because they don't think it's important. They don't. Right. They really just don't care. They could yeah. ask somebody how something. I mean, it's like, know, it's like, no, like, it's fine. Yeah, and it's not like there's been people on the internet the entire time talking about these characters, right? Who spent their whole life reading them or anything. But <laughs> anyhow, that's just that just sounds like sour grapes. So. <laughs> I mean, do I need to bring up GIF and Jif? <laughs> well, true. Yeah. Well, that and that that's that's actually a really interesting case because the the creator of the GIF is just wrong. Because he says Jif. He says Jeff, but yeah. it's, it's it's the graphics Graphic. image <laughs> format. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that might help your brain, uh. but there's no actual rule of abbreviation and acronyms that force it to sound the same as the way it is pronounced as individual words. So That's I'm right to say true. NASA. 
So, so they <laughs> said no one in Florida. <laughs> but you could uh, technically, but I they've always said NASA. So. Nabisco. Nabisco is in, what? Yeah, the I National Biscuit the, Company. Uh, oh, Nabisco. <laughs> Nabisco, National Biscuit Company. Anyway, no, it I should just the proper way right. <laughs> to pronounce it should be Chief. Chief? <laughs> the full <the laughs> guttural stop. Chief. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have one final story on my list okay. Uh, okay. that um, uh, and I, I told you about, you know, the, the huge artist alley at Wizard Worlds and things mm, like that. Yes, so yes. I went to Wizard World, Texas. This was when we came out with the Fanzine Presents Job Wanted 80 page giant book. Oh, yeah. And I've got a, that. And a lot of us went there uh, to promote it. Um, I really thought, you know, I, I was really hoping it would sell more than it did, but we, we had a pretty good turnout and we had uh, some people at our table to kind of draw attention. Like, um, uh, well, this is kind of funny. We're talking about how to pronounce stuff. Um, Scott McCullough says, Drew's here. I, I'm like, I don't know who Drew is. He wasn't uh -huh. one of the people on the book. And then later I see it says, it says Drew, Drew Garaki's here. And he's, I told you Drew Jerisy's here. I'm like, oh no, oh, <laughs> I, I thought it was Garaki. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> it's like, if you'd said Drew Garaki's here, I'd been like, wow. He's like, but it's, it's pronounced Jerisy. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. It was about three years ago. I learned it was Mignola. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mike Mignola. <laughs> I've been saying Mignola for years. If you see the comic book, the movie that Mark Hamill did, he actually has the guy who plays Hellboy saying Mike Mignola is over there. <laughs> so Ron Perlman is like, yeah, you can go talk to Mike Mignola. <laughs> oh, I, I see. I always heard people saying Mignola, but I'm like, isn't it an Italian name? Yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 you know, I did grow up around a lot of Italians. <laughs> no, okay. There are a lot of comic book uh, uh, names that I got wrong over the years. So, um, yeah, there's. <laughs> oh, I'm sure there's some I still get wrong. Yeah. yeah the, like uh... Bruce 1A. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and no sooner. See, this is the problem. I'm not ready to talk about it. No sooner do I start than I'm like, ah, what was that name? <laughs> I don't have it on the top of my head. Anyway, the last story was when I was in Wizard World 2004. 2003 2000 it was it was like december 2003 i think um because this was right before cross gen failed so which would have been spring of 2004 and so it's like this is around the time that it's imploding you know sadly right around that time so we're at wizard world uh whatever it was i think it was january it might have been 2004 so we're down in wizard world texas and there's uh, so I've been wandering around Artist Alley. I'm trying to run into the uh, the head of DC because by this point you have to get permission. You have to get permission to submit. You mm -hmm. have to like show him your stuff and say, "Can I have permission to send something to pr submit stuff?" They won't even let you submit stuff to editors without having permission first. Is the way it's working under Dan Didio. Well, I see Dan Didio wandering around. I tried to. I, I could never seem to get to him. Um, John Morgan Batneal did get to talk to him and got permission to submit. And I was like, oh, just verbally? Because by the time that happened, I had actually gone to stand in line and went to talk to him and said, could I get permission to submit? And he's like, uh, send your book in. And I'm like, okay, I will. And I'm like, yay! <laughs> and I go back. And then an hour later, John got verbal permission just right off the bat. I'm like, what did I do wrong? <laughs> if, if I'd known that he liked metal men, I could have told him that we might've had something. To talk about. I didn't know that at the time. So anyway, the DC booth is something I've been eyeing the whole time, you know, and I'm looking over at the DC booth and there's a line uh, around three quarters of this big square. Cause they take up a gigantic section. It's not just one booth. They have a square that you can come on all four sides of these tables. And, and people are around three sides and out the door. And I'm like, what the heck is happening over there? So I I walked over. I'm trying to figure out what it is. I'm like, is it is it uh, George Perez? Because George Perez did have a 
a thing there. He had a sign, but his signing was in another room. So who could it possibly be? I can't imagine anybody besides George Prez drawing that kind of attention. <laughs> and I, I said, why is there a line here? And somebody said, Oh, it's Jim Lee's signing. I'm like, Jim Lee. I, I vaguely, it's like, I know he, he's, he's a good artist, but I never understood the line out the door for Jim Lee and not for all these other people. Cause I've been walking past other artists who are paying for their own artist alley stuff and have nobody waiting for them, you know? And, and so I'm, I'm like, this is weird. And as I'm walking past the one open side of the DC booth, there, you know, everybody's just kind of, it's the Jim Lee signing. There's nothing else to do. Nobody else gets attention while the, the line is around the table for Jim Lee. And I see this guy in a Hawaiian shirt, rather tall guy, almost looks like Chuck Dixon, but I know Chuck's not there. So I'm, I, so I kind of like, who is this? And I lean in to see who it is. It's Kurt Busiek is standing there bored. <laughs> and I'm like, why there should be a line out the door for Kurt Busiek, you know, and there isn't. I'm like, what are you doing here? I, and I'm like totally unprepared to talk to him because I didn't even know he was there. <laughs> but I'm, I shook his hand and I'm like, oh, the, the, the Astro City. Ah! And I'm like, <laughs> because obviously my, you know, my superhero hospital book is a lot inspired by Astro City, you know, from mm -hmm. that kind of real world living within the world of the superheroes type thing. So I didn't even want to, you know, well, at the time I wasn't pitching Metro Med. We, this was still, you know, I'm talking about the other book, but I'm thinking about that, you know, and, and I'm just a huge Astro City fan. I'm totally unprepared to say anything. And I just, it, I hate talking to famous people because I don't know what to say that doesn't sound like what they've heard a hundred other times. You know, there's, there, when Weird Al Yankovic came to Rochester here, I didn't even, I could have afforded to go into the private Thing where you have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with him and it's like what am i gonna say <laughs> I, I have nothing to say to weird al that he hasn't heard <laughs> so I'm, no i don't i'm not gonna go meet him <laughs> it's like <laughs> biggest my my biggest art you know mm -hmm. my biggest musician uh idol <laughs> like i'm not gonna go meet him i, I would just bleh, <laughs> like like meeting kurt buziak so yeah yeah so that's my other embarrassment. <laughs> that was a uh, that was when he was doing Power Company, wasn't it? Probably. Um, and I, I just picked up the first four issues at a at a sale down in in Lincoln last weekend. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, Power Company was was pretty cool. I don't know why it didn't have uh, didn't do better, but um, yeah, uh, at yeah, least the, the Power Company's debut kind of prompted DC to come out with the the big metallic cover man manhunter series the collected series yeah, and I, yeah. I finally got to read that just to under, understand who this guy is who's now in black and the yeah the, yeah the, that was that was um, well, walt simonson right yeah and uh oh come on archie goodwin archie goodwin thank you yeah, yeah it was so such so, so good so good i picked that up probably well geez it was probably yeah. back then I probably yeah, because it, it would have come out right around the time. Because yeah, yeah. it's good. See, that's smart. We're talking about how they don't think to release stuff at the right time <clears> to <throat> take advantage of that. Well, they did release that so that you could go get your <clears throat> your recap of who is this guy, mm -hmm. and probably boosted sales of one. One probably boosted the sales of the other. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that was actually smart. And and <laughs> it's like when when's the last time they did that? <laughs> Doing something smart, <laughs> releasing um, trade paperbacks, you know. Probably, <laughs> I mean, realistically, probably re-releasing um the stripe omnibus, the stars yeah. of stripe omnibus is a star girl omnibus. That was probably probably the last time they did something like that. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, and that was four or five years ago now, something like that. Well, that's it for my stories. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Except for, except well, I've for got running, in, running into a Playboy model. That's the only other thing yeah. on my list. Metal, you were saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no, I'd actually, I'm, I'm suddenly more interested in that than what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, I just, I, I went past the artist alley table for Playboy model. It's just, <laughs> oh, okay. That, that's kind of weird to run into. It, you know, I was really talking weird. about they Cynthia Rothrock, and it's like, then you run into, it's like, what's weird is she has pictures of her naked to sell. And I'm like, how do you, 
how do you purchase a picture of a person naked talking to them at their table? I can't <laughs> imagine doing that. <laughs> mm. yeah, Straight eyed so... with boundless courage. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's all. That's all, all yeah. I had. <laughs> yeah, so I've got something. It's not exactly a horror story. It's also not at specifically a comic convention. But I do have something really cool that happened to me once that has, is kind of bittersweet. So I, I guess I could go in there. And it was... Um, I, w I was regular to the Screw Attack gaming convention, which ran uh, throughout the tens, right? And it was a, a really big convention that people would even come to internationally ran by the website screw attack uh, which had a huge community that i was a part of and that's why i would show up plus it was in my neighborhood so why not go and i have this tendency that when i go to conventions with people i have to preface this entire story with this i don't sleep like it's it's a three-day convention that never shuts down like the arcade is open all night long even when the panels and stuff aren't running so i was awake at the time of this event for roughly 62 hours, mm. right? Mm. And I, I actually operate really well on low sleep. Even going multiple days without sleep, my brain probably operates better than most people in general. But this is still uh, 60 or so hours without sleep, right? Yeah, that's, that's, the, <laughs> that, it, 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 that's roughly about the time you start seeing things. I've, you know, I've done 78 hours and I've never saw anything, but I've had auditory hallucinations before. Um, <laughs> I, I, yeah. I've got some stories that I'm not going to tell right now, but I've got some stories. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm at the convention. I decided I was going to cosplay one of my favorite video game related cartoon characters. If you've watched the show uh, before, you probably know who I'm talking about. Captain N. I was running around in my Captain N cosplay. One of the reasons I was running around in my Captain N cosplay, too, is because Craig Skitsmith, the guy who ran Screw Attack, was also a big fan. And he's like, I would love it if somebody showed up to the convention dressed as Captain N. Right? I was like, well, of course, I love Captain N. I'll, I'll show up. Mm -hmm. right? And I'm, I'm just minding my own business, doing the thing. And he was going to be running a game show later that evening, like, like right before the convention shut down. It was going to be like the last thing before closing ceremony. And I'm, I'm, I'm just playing video games, and he taps me on the shoulder and is like, hey, I got to get a lot of stuff from my station wagon like into the backstage to set up. Do you want to help me? You got a few guys, so I rounded up like my crew, like my brother, a couple of our friends. We went off and we helped them carry everything. I'm hanging out with them for a little bit backstage, uh, getting some pictures and stuff like that. And then later, as I'm waiting in line for the game show, he comes up to me again. He's like, "I need your uh, your Screw Attack username, and I also need to know what your favorite video game is." Uh, and I'm like, "Okay, that's a very weird thing to just ask somebody out of nowhere." But oh, okay, okay. So I'm sitting there in the audience, and on the game show, I didn't know how it was going to run. They just start calling up people by their username, and I'm one of the people that gets called up on stage to participate in this game show, which was pretty cool. And like a normal game show, every single event kind of started with a question and then a game, right? And the question that I was asked was, what was the first game that the Konami code was in? And everyone started booing me because I had the right answer and they thought I had it wrong because obviously everybody thought it was Contra. It's actually Galaxian. If anybody bothered to like know their video game history, they would know that. <laughs> they were booing me, but I'm right. Uh, they would have all gotten I honestly it wrong didn't audience. know either of those. Yeah. <laughs> but like, I'm up there. And he's like, okay, well, we don't have Galaxian, but. We're going to have you play Contra, and you have to get through the first level with only the three guys. You can't put the code in or anything. And here's another problem. So because I'm at like 62 hours of not sleeping, my body starts defaulting into muscle memory because like I'm not exactly processing oh, everything. No. So instead of like rapid firing in Contra like a normal person would, I have this habit that I used to play a game called Contra Golf with me and my friends, which is oh. to see how few times you can fire going through Contra. <laughs> I'm usually the winner on that. But I am definitely, definitely not good at that without any sleep. And I died, um, like, 
I think, 12 times. He gave me several retries, too. <clears throat> because I, I was getting really close to the end. Like, I would avoid all of the enemies and stuff on the way to the boss on the first level. But I, I'd keep dying. And at, at the very end, he had to give me, like, a... Um, what's it called? Like, a consolation prize that he eventually mailed to my house. But I felt so bad because if I had passed that stage the final thing for winning the grand prize was all of the other winners had to play Super Smash Brothers against each other. And I'm watching them play. And like, e even on that little sleep, I could have muscle memoried my way past all of those horrible players and I would have won a trip to, um, what's it called? The Rooster Teeth Expo in uh, Australia. I was like, I could have went to Australia for the first time in my life. But no, I had a muscle memory in a contra golf. Uh, you're muted or something. Who? Cool. I said we have a couple of comments from the chat. Uh, Tankatron, thank you for joining. I don't think I've seen you around before. So does hey, anyone know Richard... Tankatron. Oh, it's cool. Does anyone know of Richard Garrison, a major art collector? He used to have booths at cons. I don't remember what comic he specialized in. I do not know Richard Garrison. So I can't be helpful. I don't know if anyone else knows or not. I know I've heard the name, but I don't know why. Yeah. <clears throat> name sounds really familiar. <clears throat> Hiroshi Paradox says, a Galaxian, isn't that a Namco game? The predecessor of Galaga. Uh, Galaxian's owned by multiple companies. It was one of those very earlier things. Ooh, there you go. I, mm. See, I wouldn't even know. Yeah. Oh, my Joe gosh. Sheet. State is pronounced Staten. <laughs> <laughs> I told oh, you I, the name. The name escaped me at the moment. Another one is Dijuniga. Uh, the uh, when I met them, I, I met the Dijunigas, <laughs> the guy and his wife. Um, I, I thought it was Zuniga. It, it's uh, and it's pronounced a little differently. I I actually talked to them for an hour. Like while while we were both eating during the uh, break, they were in the uh, the break room for the artists and at uh, at Falcon, and oh, she is so nice. His wife was so nice. Um, anyway, I happened to come past their their spot, and he says, "Take take any one of my art, uh, any one of my art prints. Go ahead, take one." And I start flipping through them and flipping through them and flipping through them. There is not one woman that has her breasts covered in any of the artwork. Oh, wow. And I'm like, I'm, tr and I'm looking and I'm looking. And finally his wife says, you're trying to find one you can take home to your wife, aren't you? <laughs> said, yes. <laughs> I finally find the one where she only has one boob showing. And I said, this is the one I guess. And he signed it for me and gave it to me. He's a nice guy. But I'm like, I want to have something. Did leap over the nip? So I wish I could have put it on my wall. <laughs> okay. That's amazing. Absolutely. All respect amazing. to the late great artists. I just, <laughs> they were lovely. All of them were wonderful pieces. It's just, I'm trying to find something I could hang up. <laughs> For when I mean, my minister father comes over to my office. <laughs> fair. Yeah. Fair. Oh, dear. There's one more convention story I hadn't even planned on telling. And I do have the artwork for that one, but I can't show it online. I don't oh, want to yeah. get you banned. <laughs> well, I, I, everything is for my, my channels for adults. So, oh, okay. Yeah. I, do you want me to go I get it? Yeah. <laughs> I don't care. No, um, I specifically, I specifically put it that way in case you know somebody drops an f bomb or something. We don't get ah. you know dinged under kids' rules. <laughs> so, um, because you never know what I'm gonna say. I don't always know what I'm gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, I think that's a show. I think we've we, we've come full circle. To this, there's anything I forgot? I don't. I don't know. I, I feel like th this side. I mean, this side of the table didn't get as much time to talk. Sorry. Yeah, I had some stories, but I don't think we have enough time. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you have one good one? I yeah. <laughs> I feel like they all connect to each other. I don't. I don't. Didn't mean to monopolize the show. <laughs> well, it was your idea. I mean, if anybody deserved to monopolize it, 
Well, yeah. Okay. Maybe we'll do a, si- a sequel we'll, someday. Well, we'll have I to. Have I mean, I, more stories. <laughs> honestly, honestly, I like I like that because I I know that Twitless has has some stories. That's true. So, mm-hmm. so it would be it, it, would, it would be it'd be fun to have maybe a different panel of folks on, um, who have uh who have some different stories. So yeah. maybe we'll do a, maybe we'll do a Comic Con horror stories part. Oh two. darn! Tankatron probably uh tuned in tonight specifically thinking he was going to be watching Twitless. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, Twitless decided to. I mean, I, 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 that sounds condescending. Decided to take the night off, but that's what happened, and that's fine. <laughs> We're all yeah, he, he, he might have forced to take the night off. We don't know if it was. A yeah, decision we, yeah. That, it's, you know, there could be could somebody be holding him at gunpoint. For all I know, I don't know. No, he's just always so busy that whenever we have uh, a Superman night, that's literally like the cheese that lures him in. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait for him to get less busy. I think he thinks it'd be great. <laughs> well, I'm not going to put that one up there. I don't think they are, but I wouldn't know if they weren't. Um, I, Yeah, is he safe? Is he all right? I think he's just tired. So he's uh he's he's been working really hard on his 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 uh, doctoral thesis. So I know that's it. So anyhow. So we're going to call it uh, next week, Mike Barron, to talk about the new um, Nexus uh, crowdfunder that's going to be up there. And I'm going to come up with some questions about uh, the Badger and who knows what else. So it'll be fun. Um, And then the week after, I believe that is when we're doing a My Favorite Dinosaur comic. So um, I believe that is is what we're doing in two weeks. So um, tune in. Until next time, get out there. And read some comics later. Oh, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. If you happen to be in Lincoln, Nebraska, the uh, I will tell you this, through the end of the month, they are having a huge sale at the Toys of the Past. Everything's, like, discounted massively at the Indian Village store. Not at the other store, but the Indian Village store. And uh, last week, I picked comics up for 40% off, oh. which made them, like, you know, there, there are comics are already a dollar a piece. So come on, guys. You guys want to go pick through some bins, some uh, dollar bins? Go do it. Okay. That's buy, also, yeah, buy yeah. my merch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, uh, <laughs> so, anyway, that's it. Go out there, read some comics. If you're in Lincoln, get some cheap. We'll talk to you guys all next time.